we should be live. Yeah. All right, I'm trying to get onto the chat here. All right, hey everybody, welcome to the Dan Bowen Photography Podcast. Tonight I have a very special guest, it's a, another YouTuber who does uh, videos on film photography. So I have Eduardo with me tonight. So Eduardo, just for some, some of the people in the audience who might not have seen your stuff, why don't you give like a brief overview of who you are and what you do here on YouTube? Um, okay, my, my name is Eduardo. I'm a, I'm a writer, but I have a YouTube channel about photography. So I, I guess I'm a writer photographer. And yeah, I, I usually uh, post videos of myself taking photos on the street and, and my wife follows me and, and then I shoot up, I, I show all the role, the whole role that I shoot that day. So that's what I do. I just post videos of me taking pictures and talking about that, I guess. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I, I think I found your channel initially through your shoot film videos. Mm -hmm. And like, I was like, instantly fascinated because like I hadn't really seen any content before, like most of the film photography content I had watched was you know, people doing camera reviews or talking about a camera, but like you kind of give this hands on, like you out on the streets, like shooting photos. So I guess what, what inspired you or compelled you to start a channel, a YouTube channel about photography? Because I know you said it's like, it's not your main thing. Um, well, it's, it's, it's kind of a long story, but I can summarize it in this way. I was, I was living in Berlin with, Fran, Fran is my wife, and she had a YouTube channel back when we were in Chile, but she uploaded just a few videos. And then when we moved to Cologne in 2013, she was uploading on her YouTube channel. She had a series going on. She was talking about her life, blogging sometimes. And then by 2000, I guess it was 14 or something like that, uh, we were in Berlin and I, I, it wasn't a very good moment in my life, I guess. It wasn't a very happy moment. I, I had many expectations when we moved to Germany. I thought I'll be like studying a master's degree and screenwriting. And then I ran out of money and I didn't get the funds and I didn't get the scholarship. So we had to move to Berlin. Uh, so it wasn't a really happy moment in my life. And then I have friends who mm -hmm. suggested me, yeah, you could start a YouTube channel. You're going to meet a lot of people that way. And friend already had a YouTube channel. So I said, okay, I'm going to start by just opening a channel and see what happens. And I started with a review of the Leica M8 because I knew the camera, I like if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna make a video, I'm gonna make it on something I can, I can hardly fail to miserably. So I decided yeah. to talk about <laughs> the camera that I know, so it wouldn't be like completely awkward. Mm -hmm. And then the second video I was just, I decided to go outside and just shoot a whole roll and show the results because I, I guess in a way of opening myself to this audience that I didn't have at the time. So it was like, okay, if I'm going to start a YouTube channel, I might just show all my flaws and all my, my, my problems. And if I take a really horrible picture, I, I'd rather just show it to the world and be done with it. So that was the spirit in which the, the channel was founded, I guess. Very cool. Yeah, I think it's like one of the things that really comes across in your videos is like, this sense of authenticity and like you're really like I feel like when I'm watching your videos you're not like playing yourself up or playing like some personality or whatever like you're really just showing your like your style the type the type of stuff you like to shoot and everything and like with the the great stuff and the the stuff that might not be as great so um, what is it that I guess draws you into film photography in particular? Cause that, you know, we've got all this fancy like digital technology these days and like cameras that can do crazy things like shoot mm -hmm. 20 frames per second stills. So what's the appeal for you in, uh, shooting film photography? Um, I guess, well, there are many things I started, I started being interested in, in film photography because I had no clue about it. I didn't know how to develop. I didn't know any roles. I didn't, I had no clue about anything of the whole film world. So I, 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 it was, it started in a moment when I really wanted to learn something new. Every once in a while in my life, I decided to start learning about something. And it always happens that you think about, I don't know, photography, film photography. And, and when you get deeper and deeper, it becomes like a rabbit hole. And everything is like that. Everything, every single hobby you can think of, it's like a damn rabbit hole that goes like, and you have like brands and the more expensive model and the second and the entry level and you have like, oh man 
So when I got into film photography, I was interested in finding one of those rabbit holes. In, I was already working as a photographer, but I wanted to have like some kind of uh, refreshment on the whole thing. And then what made me stay was the fact that it was, uh, it was kind of chaotic. I, like I could develop a role and then suddenly it could turn out really bad or maybe the camera was not working properly, but I had no clue how to test that, but only after I had shot the role. So that kind of lack of control and the possibility of failure, I guess, made me stay. It wasn't, I don't know, I get the feeling, maybe I'm wrong and maybe this is just like some kind of, oh, this is my perspective. But um, when, I, when I see like digital pictures, usually I feel like they're something like perfect in a way. It's like you can make everything perfect. You can shoot a thousand pictures and find the right moment where everything is perfect. So that that constant obsession with perfection, I guess, ended up sickening me. And I just wanted something more raw and more like, okay, I'm going to take one shot of one subject and that's it and move to the next one. And if it sucks, then too bad. I got to be better for the next one. So it was a way of being more cruel with myself and trying to improve. Yeah, I definitely like... I can definitely see that with digital photography, like people are really chasing like sharpness and like a super crisp image and they do all this, you know, photo manipulation in post. And some people are very creative with it and come up with some, some really cool stuff, but like, oh, you yeah, don't really yeah, have, sure. yeah, you just don't have that latitude with film. And for me, film was such a great learning experience because before, you know, like even the cameras themselves, they have so many automated features that like, it's hard to take a bad picture, you know, like if you're shooting on like, you know, <laughs> if you're shooting like aperture priority or, or whatever, like it's hard to screw up the exposure and that sort of thing. So like, yeah, but when I, I the first film camera I shot with was a like all manual, like manual focus, manual exposures, there was nothing automatic. So I was like, if I'm going to take a, like these pictures and spend money on the film and the developing, like I better learn how to like, nail everything mm -hmm. and yeah. it like trickled over into my digital photography because now I shoot all manual when I'm shooting digital too and that was something I never did before so that's cool I just feel like it's had this impact uh, for me it was kind of I want to say the opposite but for example I was shooting all manual in digital and I was usually shooting I was shooting very little like I was taking weddings and during the weddings I was shooting I started shooting like a thousand pictures and then it, it went lower and lower until I was shooting 800 or 900 and I was then giving to a client like basically 700. So my, my, my accurate radio was quite high on digital, but, but I felt like there was something lacking in the whole process. So mm -hmm. weirdly enough, the, 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 the cameras that I got when I started getting to film, it was, I started with, I mean, my sister, gave me a Herbie Nolte X700, which is still one of my favorite cameras. And then I bought an, uh, the Chilean version of eBay. I got a Canon A1. So I was shooting mostly mm -hmm. with a aperture priority or, or shutter priority mode. And it was weird for me because I wasn't used to that. I was used to full manual. Mm -hmm. So I had to let this old beast handle some things. And it was, it was a way of losing control at the same time. Like, okay, I'm going to just rely on this camera to thing for me a little bit and I just work on composing the shot for example yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense so it's just it's funny you just had like like you started with manual and then kind of worked into automatic on the film side and I did the opposite so yeah <laughs> people have people have different paths on it so I wanted to talk a little bit more about your your YouTube channel because you alluded to this earlier um, you said your partner Fran has a YouTube channel and you know, she has a very successful YouTube channel, has, you know, 120,000 subscribers. And I know she's like, she helps you film videos and you help her film videos and stuff. What kind of impact do you feel like Fran has had on, on your YouTube channel, either in terms of like technical support or emotional support or motivation? Like, how do you feel that she's impacted you and in, in the way you operate on your channel? Oh man, she's, she's like, um, She's, she's many steps like uh, in front of me on the, on the whole YouTube thing and the whole internet thing in general. She started really early 
And I, I, I really didn't want to have a YouTube channel for a long time. When she started, she was like, oh, you should have your own thing. And I was like, uh, what am I going to do? Like, am I going to talk about photography? Like another, <laughs> another channel of photography with a guy <laughs> shooting? And like, no, it, it really felt wrong inside. And then I remember we were, we were talking in a restaurant and she was like, what, 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 why won't you do it? And I was like, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't think I want to open myself that much and like present myself on the internet uploading videos about me. Mm -hmm. But then I guess what, what happened later is that I saw her with her own YouTube channel, what she was doing, and she had no persona. It was just her behaving of course on youtube channel you don't behave exactly exactly like yourself when you're in pajamas mm. and like watching tv or whatever but you behave she had a very nice description one time that i asked her and she said and on, on youtube you behave like when you have uh guests at your house so you open the house and you're like friendly and you're yourself but you're you're like a little bit like friendlier because you have guests over mm -hmm. so i guess that vision of oh man so i can have a channel i can be myself i don't have to try to do weird things okay that sounds good so during the whole process she is always like since she has more followers and she's doing her thing for a longer period of time she knows more or less the crisis and like what, what might happen or they be attentive to this thing or this other thing. She helps mm -hmm. me film my videos. I help her editing her videos. I'm not really mm -hmm. editing her videos anymore. I started doing that. Now I'm color correcting her videos mostly. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but we give feedback to each other. So it's a nice thing that in our relationship, the YouTube is like this hobby that we both have, but it's like a serious hobby anyway. Um, for example, now I have these lights. See, I guess... They're, they're like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like this is not the lighting for my living room I mean, yeah you're like glowing that. man <laughs> yeah i'm just magical so <laughs> for example when we got these lights it was like oh my god we're, we're getting lights now this is like we're, we're becoming youtubers so <laughs> it's like these little <laughs> details that make you think like okay it's it's our hobby but it's it's kind of important at the same time we spend a lot of time doing it so we better just i don't know enjoy <laughs> it <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to take one question in here from the chat. So Sean Keen asked, what is your favorite Polaroid or other film camera? Oh, my favorite film camera. Um, I, I guess the x pen is still my favorite camera. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I guess the X-Pan. I also shoot a lot with the, with, with the Leica M3 and the Mamiya C330. Those are like the three cameras that I use the most. But, but as a film camera, the X-Pan is definitely my favorite. The problem with the X-Pan is that since it's this longer format, uh, I, I get used to shoot with the X-Pan and then every other camera that gets in my hands <laughs> feels weird. So <laughs> it, when, when I went to Mexico, I didn't bring the X-Pan at the beginning. Like I spent a month and a half without it. because so I was like, I need to shoot other films. If I keep shooting only the X-Pan when I'm back in the UK and trying to film an episode, it's going to be terrible. I'm going to be composing anything. <laughs> so, so yeah, it has that drawback that it's a really magnetic camera. Um, and the results are really pretty. I don't enjoy shooting it too much. Like I don't, every time I'm shooting the x I feel like the pictures are going to be horrible. I have this self-doubt feeling all the time that I'm using it. And then when I see the results, I'm really happy. So I, it's, it's this constant, like, it's going to fail, but it works. Like this relationship, it's double. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's such a cool camera. Like, I mean, I've seen other people shooting with it. Like, I saw um, Neil Ta. I think he. I think he's. He has a connection with Eric Kim in the street photography community, and he did a whole year where he was shooting. Uh, he did a 365 project where he shot it all on the X Pan, and he mm. shot a lot of photos in Cuba and stuff like that. And he had some really cool results. But like, I watch your videos in the X Pan. I'm like, man, I want to get one of those. Like, it's such yeah. a cool camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really cool. It's uh, and it's gorgeous. It's good looking, and it's like longer. It like it draws attention. Yeah, it's nice, but it has that problem that it's yeah, it it messes up with your composition. So you start thinking in a weird way. Everything is longer, and then yeah. when you go to another format, you feel like oh, how am I gonna how am I gonna fit more stuff in here? Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you about the. Um, 
this is a camera that you have shot with a few times, but you always kind of uh, <laughs> your cats <Yeah>. meowing. <laughs> but um, I wanted to talk about the Nashika N8000 because it's funny. Oh. You've done a couple of videos on that camera, and every time you pull it out, you're like, I didn't want to make another video with this camera. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I, I love it, and I hate it so much at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, for people who might not know what the Nishika N8000 is, can you give like a just a quick overview of what kind of camera it is and like why it's kind of like quirky? Uh, it's a lenticular camera. It's a, it, it has four lenses, and when you press the shutter, it, it releases four pictures. So your negative has four half frame pictures. So you end up with a double. It, it's like this long and divided in four, and it, the lenses are slightly apart. So when you put that on a GIF. I don't know if you say GIF or JIF. I'm, I'm part of the GIF uh, people. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all in the GIF crowd there too. Okay. okay cool. <laughs> so we, the GIF, when we make GIFs, we create like this thing that, uh, it's a lenticular printing. So you see like it was in 3D. The problem is it's super time consuming and you have to scan the, the image and then put it on Photoshop and then crop every single image, align it, put it as a, as a layer. And uh, it's so time consuming. At the same time, the results are pretty. Something, re something really happened, really weird that happened with that camera it, is that I bought it. I originally saw a, a, a friend of ours. We were in Berlin and there was this girl named Mira and it was Mira's birthday and she was taking pictures with this weird looking camera. I was like, oh, that's, that's weird. She's like, oh, you can visit my Tumblr later. And I saw the picture and I saw myself like moving on 3D. I was like, oh man, that's crazy. I want that camera. And <laughs> I searched on, on Amazon and it was like $20 or something. So I got mm -hmm. one and I was like, oh, it costs nothing. If it really sucks, I'm going to just, I can give it away. And, and then I, I decided to keep it. I shoot one roll, two rolls. And I was like, okay, it's fun, but I'm going to just put it here under the bed for now. Maybe someday <laughs> I'm going to shoot it again. Then I made an episode for the channel. And for some odd reason, this is completely unrelated. I don't know why I'm talking <laughs> about this, but I'll talk about this anyway. Uh, somebody wrote me on my Instagram a few days ago and he was like, hey, man, would you, would you be willing to sell me your, your Nishika? Because I'm trying to buy one on eBay. And I'm like, why? No, they keep winning the auction and it's too expensive. And I searched and it's like $150 now. And it's climbing. No way. That's and crazy. I'm like, why, why is that happening? It's so <laughs> weird. Like the fluctuation of prices. I was like, please don't pay that amount of money. That's a ripoff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for people who haven't seen it, it's entirely made out of plastic. Like, it's it's basically a toy camera. And um, I actually bought one after I watched your episode because I was like, I want to try that. Like, I know it's so time-consuming and stuff, but I want to try it. But I think I paid, like, 20 or $30. But, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, like, <laughs> the market, like, apparently the market has gone up. I think maybe you drove the prices <laughs> up or something. <laughs> Uh, I wish I'm not the guilty on that one. I, then, then I regret it. Like, I should have bought 20 of those and be a millionaire. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's like stock markets on Bitcoins. God, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Buy low, sell high. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> so let's see. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your approach to street photography. Because um, I've notice like you have a particular style of street photography that I really admire and one of the things that I've noticed like watching your videos is that you are able to get very close to the subject without in most cases without them noticing so what is your sort of approach to to photography on the street and how you can like kind of create this scene before you without disturbing the elements in it because I noticed like when maybe it's because I'm self-conscious or something when I'm out with a camera on the street or something like as I raise the camera or as I get in position for to take like a candid street photo like it seems like the people always seem to notice me <laughs> <laughs> maybe you're too interesting who knows man yeah I don't know <laughs> uh how do I do it um I, I guess what I do is I go out on the street and try to get the vibe of what's happening and then just try to blend in. It's, there's no, it's like, he, here's the thing, like it, it's gonna, it's gonna sound weird, but I think this is the most honest answer I can give. When, when I, there's no trick to do it, it's just practice. Um, and I usually, the best way to practice is just go out and confront the fear of 
facing other people because it's terrifying. We're all super self-conscious and we don't want to be awkward and we don't want to feel like cringy. Like we sit around with a camera next to somebody and we feel like we're doing something wrong in our heads. Like mm-hmm. I'm gonna, maybe I'm, in, I'm being invasive. So the whole thing, it's like, it's like when they say that dogs smell fear, I guess people smell awkwardness. So, mm-hmm. so when there's somebody sitting there and, and, and you come out like a little nervous that they're going to check on you, they're going to like turn around and see what's happening because you can feel it. Like if you're alone and you, you feel somebody, they turn around. But if you are there anyway, like if, if, what I usually do is I'm super obvious when I have the camera. So I'm, I have my camera around and I, 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 I walk around the person so she knows or he knows that there's somebody there with a camera. And then mm-hmm. I have plenty of time because they're usually doing other things, like checking their phone or reading or talking or whatever. So when they're not looking at me, I pre-focus and then I wait and I wait and then I take, I take the picture. But I usually take some time to scout the scene. So it's not like just going straight and take the picture of their face and wow, like amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I try to make it as, as, less, as less obtrusive as possible. I think mm-hmm. like if, if it were me, like if I was sitting there and somebody comes with a camera, what would be the best way that I will feel good if somebody came to me? So I try to play that game. I'm, I'm usually I'm usually right in the way that I approach. Um, of course, I fail like like everybody. There's sometimes I take a picture <laughs> like what's happening. Oh, I'm sorry, man. It's all good. Yeah, it's all good. But it was weird. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so it, it varies, but usually it's it's they're good people. Like humans are cool, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, I think I think that kind of gets to the heart of it because yeah, like I when I go out when I used to go out and take candid street photos, like now I shoot mostly portraits, and that's sort of the direction I've gone. Um, but when I used to do like candid street photography, like I would always feel like nervous that I was going to get like confronted or yelled at or something. Um, and which, you know, I, I, there were times when I didn't feel that way. And those were the days when I, when I was most successful in taking candid photos and not having people notice me. So I do think it's like whatever you're self-conscious about kind of projects and other people can feel that. What, if they, even if they can't put their like finger on it, they're like, oh, there's some guy there with a camera and he seems like nervous. Like, what's that guy doing, you know? Yeah, that usually happens, for example, on my YouTube channel, many people come and because I love taking pictures of children and kids playing. And everybody's like, why are you doing that? It's so creepy. Like, it's like this, this thing that you should not do, like the 10 rules, the 10 commandments. <laughs> one of them yeah. is like, those shall not shoot children. Well, I get it. But at the same time, every time I, I, I take pictures of, of children, I am super obvious that I'm taking pictures of them. Usually I have the camera and I walk around and the parents see me and I lit the camera and then they decided to ignore me. And then I have like the permission. So it's like an unwritten code. That it happens mm-hmm. in the video of course you only see me taking the picture and then leaving it, it it almost it is almost never like that there's always like a a previous agreement unspoken or or the kid is playing around and the guy sees me and i'm like hey hey and then i just lift the camera so mm-hmm. it all depends like yeah it's like a conversation like having a camera is a good conversation with other people and it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be like a physical conversation just even with the bodies enough to understand each other yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of it comes down to intention and it's, it's clear like watching your videos and seeing the, your photos and stuff that like your intention is to capture something good about humanity and to, like depict that. And so it's not like you're out there like trying to take creeper shots. Like you're trying to capture like cool photos of like interesting people and scenes and stuff. Um, and I think that's really great. So one of the, I watched your latest video that you did on uh, like seven tips for street photography. And there was one moment in there that I I really thought was funny and interesting. And it was the, one of your tips on uh, embracing the awkwardness. (laughs) And (laughs) you you have that clip of you struggling with the Mia C330 (laughs) and the person just is sitting there like, keeps glancing over at you like no you're trying to take it and then you just kind of like you just embraced it and you're just like you know trying to focus and get that so yeah. oh, it's <laughs> can so you talk awkward. a little bit about like that moment or just like similar moments where you know sometimes just embracing the awkwardness of trying to take a picture of somebody is yeah is like oh that, just, moment. Just roll that moment is like it's 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 fixed in my memory because we were in Kew Gardens it was the first time I ever had the Mamiya uh, so I just got it. It's, that's like the third uh, picture from the from the roll. So I was just 
trying to understand how to focus it and it moved like the Hasselblad. And I, I really hadn't shot the Hasselblad in months when I got that camera. I was like, okay, how is, oh, it's, it's backwards. Oh, and, and, and the weird thing with those cameras is that when you have them like this and you tilt it, you get completely dizzy because like this movement that you're not used to yeah. the, those cameras on reverse, oh, it, it messes with your head pretty bad. So I was trying to take a picture of the geese, goose, oh, I don't know in English that word, but yeah, that, that. The goose. Uh, the goose, okay. I was going to take a picture <laughs> of the goose that was just laying there. I was like, oh, that's going to be a cool picture. Just a goose, it's going to be fun. And then I feel somebody on the side. I was like, oh, there's an Asian girl that looks interesting. I might take a picture of her, but she's pretty close. I'm just going to do it anyway. And I just start turning <laughs> around. But I, I'm doing it slowly. And I, when I'm doing it, I'm like, oh, I should have done it quickly so she would notice me. Now I'm like creeping out. And then I'm pointing at her and she's like looking at a cell phone and she looks at me and I'm like, what do I do now? I, I can't pretend like I'm not doing this. I'm like, but I'm not doing anything bad. Okay, I'm gonna pre-focus on this on the duck to see like if it's infinity or not to which way, because you're gonna focus like this. <laughs> and then I move around, I focus on the duck, like, is it moving like, oh, it's this way. Okay, so now I'm going with the girl again. And then I'm focusing her. And all this time she's been looking at me really awkwardly. And then I take the picture and she smiles and I smile back and I, I leave the seat. My friend is like, man, that was so awkward to watch, man. <laughs> <laughs> and that moment got really fixated on me. I was like, okay, that was super, super awkward. I'm gonna use that someday. So I, <laughs> so I kept that footage for one day and I used it on this video. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was perfect. Cause it's funny too, watching her cause she kept glancing over at you and she was like laughing, like she was like, oh my God, like what's this guy doing? And at one point you just were like kneeling and standing up and just like, I'm just rolling with it. Yeah, I'm trying to take a picture of you. But yeah, I don't know how to use this camera. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was being as honest as I could. Like I'm, I'm, I was almost saying, I'm sorry. But I, didn't. I just kept quiet and keep doing it. Sometimes, sometimes people catch you doing weird stuff and you just gotta go with the game. People usually yeah. play it along because yeah, like, okay, you're struggling with this. I'm going to be humane. I'm not going to be an <laughs> asshole with you. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, I was doing, um, so like I said, I do mostly portraits. And that, that moment in that video made me think of a moment. I was shooting with a, a friend, and we were walking around and shopping towards the end of the shoot. So we're, like, going into the grocery store. And I'm like, well, we're here. Why don't we just, like, take a few photos while we're in here? And it's, like, a crowded, like, grocery store. And I don't, like... I've never seen people take photos in a grocery store before, but I'm like, go stand over there by the peppers or whatever. And I'm like taking pictures and like people are looking at us. <laughs> but like, I've gotten to the point where I'm like, <laughs> I'm totally immune to like people watching me take photos in public. Cause I'm just like, I don't care what I look like. I just want to get cool photos. And she would like half the photos are just her laughing awkwardly. Cause she's just like, there's people staring at us. <laughs> I was like, just roll with it. It's good. <laughs> Yeah, grab the peppers, grab the, oh, that's great, man. Yeah, yeah put some <laughs> apples on side. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good, man. Yeah. oh, maybe that could be a new trend, you know? Yeah, who knows? Yeah, keep, keep an eye on Instagram. If you see a lot of people holding, like, bell peppers or pineapples or whatever, like, <laughs> know that I was there. Best, <laughs> Trendsetter. Trendsetter. <laughs> Oh, man. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your 30 and 30 project because I know you've got videos on it and you talked about your experience um, shooting. So you did the 30, 30 rolls in 30 days with the Mia C330 camera. Mm. A lot of 30s. <laughs> but, a lot of 30s, yeah. I haven't noticed that. Yeah. Um, so how do you feel that, that that project has impacted your your street photography moving forward or what kind of impact has that had on you as a photographer? Mm, uh, it's 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 a it's a weird question. I mean, it's a, it's a weird answer because it's it, it has many ramifications. Um, so I started a project thinking that oh, this is gonna be fun. I'm just gonna do this. It's gonna be super cool, and I'm just gonna take a roll a day. And I bought this huge stack of rolls, and I start shooting them. Um, and I talked briefly about this on the video that I did about personal projects, but I, it was like day four and I didn't want to go on. I was like, this is such a bad idea. <laughs> like, 
it's it's 30 days of this thing and then I'm gonna develop and scan all of this like it seemed like a huge mountain to climb mm -hmm. and up to that point I haven't really done any I mean I have done small personal projects but nothing that big nothing that requires that amount of time because it's it's super simple just grab a camera and take pictures around your city or around your neighborhood and that's it um, I was working in London by that date and I was going to move to Hastings. So it was like a cool moment of transition between London and Hastings. And it was also like a, a, a turning point in my life of deciding, should I go and search for another job? I was working as a copywriter or just should I pursue what I'm doing and go freelancing as a writer and just go with that. So it was right on that month when I decided to like go full on again and, and, and start working as a writer freelancing because up to that point, I've had only freelanced as a photographer or videographer, but I have never freelanced mm -hmm. as a writer. So it was weird that I decided to take writing seriously while doing this photography thing, while moving out of the city. It was like all these things happening at the same time. And affected me photographically because it forced me to go to the same places many, many times and try to find different things and different people. And it also, I discovered that the, the Mamiya, it's a big monster and it, it, it forces me to approach people in a very different way that I would do with a, with a Leica, for example. With Leica, it's much easier because I, I, I have muscle memory, so I can pre-focus exactly the distance just by the fingers. So I grab the camera, I'm like, okay, this, this might be like half a meter and I can just move the camera and take the picture without even looking that much. But with the Mamiya, it was impossible because like every single inch, like a millimeter is like half a meter of distance. So it's really subtle. Um, so I have no muscle memory. And, and also, I, it, since I was looking down and not at the people, it was weird for them that like they turn around and you see like a guy with this machine looking down and approaching them. It was weird for children, especially. So it was interesting for me because I had to change the way in which I approach people and, and how I present myself with this weird monster that I have on my stomach. So at the same time, it's a funny camera, so I don't. It doesn't look like I'm a pervert and taking like pictures with a cell phone. I'm using this old thing, so it has the duality for people. Like this guy is weird, but it's it's probably not harm. Like it's not gonna harm me. He has this weird monster. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> so yeah, also it also helped me to compose better on, on square format because I was really mm -hmm. bad at it. Really, really, really. I'm still not good, but. But when I started the project, I was terrible. So it, it forced me to start thinking on how to compose for a square format. And since I had the problem that I was shooting too much with the X-Band, like the, it was the exact opposite. It was like completely packed. So it helped me to think of different formats. And that's something I really want to explore. And eventually at one point make a video about that, like how to compose for different formats and my experience with that. Cause I think it might be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, that would be really interesting. Like it's it's challenging composing with the square. Like I've only shot with a few cameras that have uh, square formats, but yeah, it's it's different than your standard, you know, three by two or you know, if you're shooting an X pan, like <laughs> super panoramic kind of kind of frame. Yeah. It challenges you to think about where to place elements in the frame in a different way. Um, I have a question. Have you have do you like to shoot with like Polaroid cameras, like old Polaroid cameras? Have you tried shooting with any of those? Uh, we we bought in Berlin a Polaroid camera. We still have it. Uh, we shot we have shot like I guess two rolls with it. But we usually buy rolls when we're going on vacation. Mm -hmm. We got one roll and we shot it. And then Fran used that when she went on vacation. I haven't used it on my vacations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have only tried like those few times the problem with Polaroid is that it's too expensive yeah and and yeah that's that's basically a problem it's way too expensive and the results are cool and it's funny and you can put it on like an it, it makes like a nice uh, fridge magnet that you can put there it's like oh mm -hmm. that moment was really nice but at the same time it's so expensive that with the with what cost me like one of those boxes of 10 shots I can buy several rolls and I can try more cameras so mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm a cheap bastard, but <laughs> regarding polar rates, I guess cost effective is it's not yeah. it's, it's not yeah, the it's, it's not an economical format, but uh yeah. yeah. 
I've, I've enjoyed shooting with it. I haven't shot with it as much lately for that very reason. You know, it's just, it's very costly, but um, I think everybody should have a, should try shooting with a Polaroid SX70 because it's a totally different experience than any other camera I've shot with. Like most of the Polaroid cameras, they, they kind of targeted like amateur, like, and like family mm. market and stuff like that. So they're mostly like most of the Polaroids are point and shoots, but that camera was more targeted toward, they really wanted to get pro photographers uh, shooting with that camera. So they like, you know, they had ad campaigns with like Ansel Adams and stuff like, and they gave him the camera to, to shoot with. And, you know, they got Andy Warhol shooting that camera. And it's just like, you know, it has manual focus and it's just, it's a fun camera to shoot with. And the mm. results are really good because like, most of the Polaroids have plastic lenses, but that one's got a glass lens. So you get, you tend to get sharper pictures with it. Mm, you're selling me the whole thing. I should try it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah, sounds like a good idea. I might, I might give it a shot. I don't know. I guess Polaroid always eludes my mind when I think about cameras. Because, you know, I've, I've been... Every time I try to think, oh, what camera would I love to shoot? There's so many weird formats that I want to try. I want to mm -hmm. shoot like 110. I want to shoot 127. I want to try different mm -hmm. things. But yeah, like Polaroid is always there, but the cost of it, it always drives me back. But maybe maybe trying that camera might, might be interesting. I should, I should give it a go for real. Yeah. Yeah, you should see if like maybe you could do a patron with that or something. Like that might be a good way to like just try it. Like, even if it's not a camera that you hold on to and shoot all the time. But yeah. let's see. So I want to go back to the chat here. So Lauren has asked, what are your favorite film stocks to shoot? My favorite film stocks to shoot? Uh, mm, that's a good question. I guess on, on black and white, it will be Tri-X. I was, I was an HP5 guy for a long time, but now I'm more like a Tri-X guy. Uh, and then on color, uh, that's a hard one. On color, I would say for now, I would say it's the Vision 3 500T for now. But yeah, but that's because I haven't tried that many color films mm -hmm. because there's so many of them. And yeah, like I, I that, this is one thing that always bugs me, like when I see reviews on YouTube, like there's always people who like buy two rolls of something and then make a review. And I'm like, how can you make a review shooting two rolls? Like that's impossible. I've, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe they're much smarter than I am. I, <laughs> maybe that's one of the reasons I am kind of dumb in that regard. Because uh, <laughs> I buy like a bunch of film and then I try it and every single roll is slightly different depending on the camera, depending on mm -hmm. how I treated the film, depending on how all my chemicals are. So everything is changing all the time. For example, today I, I, I develop a roll of Vision 3 500T and I, I put a filter on, on, on front of the lens. And I have mm -hmm. done that before, but the results were very bad. And this time I said, okay, I'm gonna try this and I'm gonna overexpose and put the filter. And I, I tried to reason a way of making it better and the results were amazing. And I was like, how does that happen? Like a few rolls ago, this combination was terrible and now it's amazing. Like, how can you make a review if that if, <laughs> if it can be like that different between one roll and the other? So for now, Vision 3500T is my favorite, but I guess when I try, I don't know, if I buy a bunch of Portra, I'll say like, oh, you know, I'm shooting Portra now, so now it's better. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but for now, that's all I have. Like I have big cans of Cinefilm and I, I have to re-spool them and, yeah, I finish yeah. those before buying more film. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, I, it's tough because, like, you know, I've I've had the idea of doing that. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna buy two rolls of that film, and then I'm gonna like shoot them and show them and like make a review. And I've never done it because every time I shoot the first two rolls, I'm like, ah, those pictures aren't that great. Like, I really I don't feel like I have a feel for the, this film stock yet. I want to like shoot more of it and like really do a better. Yeah a better review like the ones that I really felt confident doing reviews on were you know film stocks that I've shot like at least four or five rolls so that I can yeah. just be like okay like I I have a feel for it I have a feel for what it does what the characteristics are because if you don't try shooting different types of scenes and stuff you like don't really necessarily know 
what the film stock is capable of. Yeah. Yeah, they're very different. If you shoot it like a, like in in your house or outside or with different lights or the evening, so there's so many lightning situations and, and the cameras behave differently with different, different roles. Say it backwards, the roles behave differently in different cameras. So yeah, it all it all depends. It, it varies so much. Like I was shooting a roll of 550D the other day, and the roll turned out terrible, and I. It bugs me because I don't know if it was the camera or the film wasn't good or what happened. So all these things that I don't know if I'm doing correctly and I might be messing up, uh, those are the things that made me stay on film in the first place, like what we were saying at the beginning. Mm -hmm. like that kind of problems that arise are like, they put you under, they make you be more attentive of what you're doing. Like, okay, yeah. what did I did last time? Should I do it again? What, what did I like about this thing? So it forces you to get methodologies, which I'm very bad at. Mm -hmm. I'm super bad at having like methodologies for things um, yeah. in terms of work. Like on my day, I have many methods. Like I have a way of washing the dishes and I have a way of doing things. But on work, like my, my, my room is a mess. Like everything is flat in different places and it's like chaos. I like that. But on film photography, you need to have like an ordered chaos. Otherwise, yeah. everything's going to be terrible. Yeah. I know some people will leave comments on my videos sometimes like what settings did you shoot that photo at at like you know 230 in the video I'm like <laughs> like I, like sometimes I'll remember like in the aperture or something like I remember because there's like a couple apertures I'll shoot at especially with portraits it's like I'm shooting wide open or I'm shooting at like f4 where it's like sharpest yeah uh, or I'm shooting like whatever my light meter told me <laughs> <laughs> he said he was good I believed him <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It's the same like, I, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. I just, like, I, I don't fixate on the technical stuff as much because for me, I'm focusing a lot more on composing the shot. And so when I set my camera up and I set the settings, like, unless the lighting is changing a lot, I'm not really fussing with the aperture and the shutter speeds and stuff as I go along. Like, I'm not... Mm. Like I've shot enough film and I've taken enough photos that I, I kind of have a feel for what the settings need to be to like get the right exposure. You know, <laughs> like I don't, so I'm not yeah, like yeah. constantly fiddling with the, those things to like try to nail it like spot on perfect exposure every time. So like when people ask me those kinds of like people who think more technically ask me those kinds of questions and they're kind of baffled that I don't <laughs> have the answers. It's like, well, that's not what, I, that's not how I, that's not what I focus on in photography. <laughs> I'm trying to take an interesting photo. <laughs> yeah. I guess, I guess it makes sense when you're starting and you want to know, like, oh, my God, how did they do that? But as you go along, that feeling of how did he do it, it becomes like, oh, that's cool. And then, like, oh, yeah. So at one point, you feel like, oh, yeah. They're, they're not. Yeah. It's weird because in photography, like, when, when I started, I thought it was, everything was so complicated. There were so many options. And then as time passes by, I, I look and I, there are very few things you can change when you take a picture. Like, yeah, yeah you can, like with a film, you can change like the aperture and the shutter speed and call it a day. That's all you can do. So if a picture doesn't look like it's moving or it doesn't have like a blurry background, you can already tell how it was shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just getting beyond the technical details. So I wanted to, to shift gears a little bit um, and talk a little bit about your like philosophy and thoughts behind photography. Um, so you mentioned in one in a couple of your videos that one of your one thing that you really enjoy doing is uh, taking photos at protests. And you talked recently about like the, the student the project you were doing on the uh, student movement in Chile. So mm -hmm. what is it that interests you about? Uh, protest photography or sort of like that kind of like documentary style work? Um, well, I, well, I enjoy uprisings in general. I enjoy, I enjoy protests and I enjoy like people getting mad with the police and throwing things. And uh, that's part of my political activist side that I'm like, saying, yeah, that's cool, man. Um, but aside from that, uh, I, I guess what drives me to those scenarios is the, is the feeling of, Here's the thing, when I was shooting weddings, like I had a friend, Fernando, he's a, he's a photographer, uh, a wedding photographer, and we were shooting weddings together. And it, we always felt like when it was time for the vals, 
it was like ah, the moment of truth, you know, like, oh, this is going to be it. This is gonna, it's dangerous, man, because you can miss your shots and then they're going to be angry at you. And you're going to like nail the, <laughs> the keys and you're going to nail the, the, all the couples that are dancing. And you had like this adrenaline kick right before the dance. And you were like, oh, ah, it was like this weird <laughs> moment where it was super exciting. But then after shooting so many weddings, that excitement started to like fade. And then when the, when the uprising started back in Chile in 2011, uh, when it was like the, the big student uprising, we were on the, on the streets and there were people throwing rocks and the police throwing tear gas and everything was happening. And Fernando and I were together like, oh man, this is like the vals, but like for real. <laughs> <laughs> like you can get kicked in the head and you can die now. Oh man. So it was like this excitement of being in this dangerous situation, but it's not completely dangerous. You're not in a war zone. You're not going to get mm -hmm. killed, really. Like you might get injured. I like that kick me. I have lost conscience, and that has happened. But I have died because I'm alive now. Because um, <laughs> we're talking now, yeah. <laughs> I'm not a ghost, you know. So it's not it's not completely completely dangerous, but it has that dangerous feeling. So I mm -hmm. guess I guess the feeling of being in a situation that is unpredictable and also having this and this feeling of nervous and of uh, dangers that you might get hurt if you get like a rock or something and you have to be attentive and also you gotta be super this is another thing that is really interesting but when you're in a protest and you have a camera the guys who are protesting might confuse you for a disguised cop like an undercover cop mm -hmm. so you need to wear in a specific way and you need to behave in a specific way so they don't be like they don't see you as a stranger or as an alien or as an enemy. So you need mm -hmm. to not be friends with the police. You can't go to them and you can't be completely too close to the guys protesting and you can't be completely objective because then you're part of the press and the press is the enemy too. They're throwing rocks at the press. Mm -hmm. So shooting protest in Chile, at least in my experience, it was this weird, interesting and dangerous game of being part of the protest, but not throwing rocks. So you had to be one of yeah. them. But you can't be like, yeah, and then just kicking the, the cops because they're going to come for you. So it was this weird space in which you're some kind of an actor or a performer in this dangerous game. But it's interesting. Like, it, it really makes you, at least it makes me feel super alive and, like, attentive to what's going on. Yeah, that's such, like, a delicate balancing act. Like, I know, like, particularly when I was back in college, like, I would go to, like, anti-war protests and stuff like that. And, like... Yeah, there's definitely this suspicion of people taking photos because like a lot of activists don't want to be targeted as like a radical or something that like, or they think that like if they're having their picture taken, it's like people trying to single out who's resisting some policy. So yeah, it's like, that's a, that's definitely like a tightrope you got to walk as a photographer. And I, I have a couple of friends in the city here in Boston who, who go and photograph at protests and stuff. And I, I've just been curious about that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. So what do you feel um, either with like that kind of photography, like documentary photography or street photography, like what do you feel photography has revealed to you about yourself as a human being? Well, um, oh. <laughs> Man, you cut me on guard with that one. Uh, <laughs> just, just so the audience is clear, you sent me some questions before, but I had completely forgot about that one. Uh, um, man, I, what have his photography teach me? I guess what he had taught me is that my brain separates image from, from words. I guess that's, that's the most key element that I have found. Like when I'm taking, if I'm in a, if I'm in a period when I'm take, when I'm heavily taking pictures, it's very difficult for me to write with like sit down and write properly. Um, I, I like taking pictures. It, it it requires a specific set of mind, so I need to be thinking and composing mm -hmm. and trying to find relations in things that are outside of me. But when I'm writing, everything is like happening inside. So I, I'm I'm doing the same game, but with my own material. So I guess it, it has shown me that when I think about images, I think about reacting. And when I think about 
words I think about creating. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I don't know if that makes much sense, but that's, that's the way that I, I see my work working. No, that makes sense. I mean, like, because the style of photography you're doing is you're trying, you know, you're not doing posed stuff. Like you're trying to either take a picture of a protest and capture that moment, or you're taking a picture on the street that's candid and capturing that. So in a way you are trying to, you're creating a picture, but you're doing it reacting to the elements that are like, in front of you yeah. whereas if you're whereas if you're writing whatever you can happen to type out on that word processor is is what you're going to get you know so you have like a fresh screen or a fresh piece of paper to write on or whatever however you go about it um so you're basically like creating that from scratch and it can go and you have control over that yeah yeah i mean i i know what's going to happen and i can change it but in photography there's everything eludes me. So I'm constantly reacting to the world, but I'm not able to tell somebody, hey, you look great there. Could you move over there so I can take a candid? Like, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> so everything is outside of me. And I feel that's, that's, that's a really nice way to connect with other people. And writing is a really mm -hmm. nice way to connect with myself. But it's not only, like, I don't, <clears throat> I don't write like, uh, it's weird, but but every time I write, I'm thinking about conversations or talks or situations that I've had with other people. So I'm I'm trying to refresh in moments that I've already experienced. And when I'm taking pictures, I'm creating mm -hmm. those moments. So they're different. They occupy different parts of the of my brain. I don't know how the brain works, but if if I could pretend like I have a map of it, I would say that photography goes one way and writing goes another. And they they don't connect much but uh but they do connect emotionally with other people so the way in which i see other mm -hmm. people might might be connected and there's some kind of empathy in both works i guess yeah no that's great i mean do you do you kind of agree with the statement or the sentiment that like for the photographer there's a little bit of yourself in every photo you take or you sort of like interject a little bit of your your own personality or uh, like there's people who say like a photograph always reveals something about the person who takes the picture. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But I, but I think at the same time, everything you do reveals part of what you are. So if you're, mm -hmm. yeah, if you're, I don't know, if you work as a copywriter or if you work as a fixing computers, you can be an asshole fixing computers and fix it really bad and just treat bad, like treat people really bad and do it like a poor job. Or you can do like a nice thing and add some pirate software for free, you know, whatever you do <laughs> when you use the computer. But it, it, it tells something about you. So I guess in that regard, photography, sure, it shows part of what you are. But I guess that's, that's part of being human. I, that's what I like about the whole creativity thing. Like everything you do shows part of yourself. Mm -hmm. So as you've sort of like gone through this journey with photography and with like just life in general, like as you've gotten older, you know, you're still a pretty young guy, but like, as you've gotten older, what has become like more important to you in your life and what has become like less important? Um, less important, I guess, I guess other people's opinions have become less and less important opinions regarding when I was, when I, like this happens to everybody, of course, but when you're younger, the other people's opinions about you matter in some regard. Mm -hmm. I mean, they always matter. Like you're not, unless you're like the Dalai Lama and you're like completely on your own and you don't care and your ego is dead. But if you're a normal functioning human being in, in Occidental society, then yeah, other people's opinions about you might matter. But I guess they don't matter that much now. Um, and also what has become more important is try to create something interesting. So there's like right in, like a, now at this moment in my life, which might change in a few weeks or tomorrow or whatever. But right now, the most important thing for me is creating something interesting. And, and by interesting, I mean something that will, that can drive interest towards it. So mm -hmm. it can be like a book that I, I, I might be super proud and I, Oh, this is everything I want to say is here. 
or a nice picture that I just found this amazing moment and I was able to capture it. And I was like, this is exactly what I want to say in a picture or maybe not even say, but like I, I might feel proud that I was there experiencing that. And it's, it's my way of like giving something back um, or just creating something. I think, I think that the fact that we're able to create beauty is, is super important as a species. Like, man, we're, we, we're like aesthetic animals. It's so weird. It's like dogs painting, you know, like humans create beauty. It's, 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 it always baffles me how we're addicted to beauty. Like everything we have around us must be designed. It must be beautiful. It must be like organized. So in a way, we're doing that same thought process to the world. We're organizing and creating beauty all around us. And I guess that's that's what I love doing. I, I, I would love to create something beautiful and just like leave it there for a while and say, okay, I did that and I'm like good to go, you know? Like I did, yeah. I did my part to the world. I create like a little piece of beauty and then that's, that's it. I'm happy with that. Yeah. That's important for me now. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think the first thing you said too, like, not caring as much about what other people think like that's so important like it's like, like that's something i've experienced too like as i've gotten older like not being so stressed about what other people's opinions are of me has become like more important you know or like just other people's opinions of me are less important because like when you're young or whatever you're so worried about like oh what do my parents think if i do this or oh i said this I might have upset my friend because I made this offhand remark and you're so like stressed about it or like <laughs> for me one of the one of the things that <laughs> one of the things I've always struggled with and I still do is I like I've just been this like perpetual like people pleaser. Like I, I hate saying no to people. I wanna like mm -hmm. try to provide value or something and like that become like when you're saying when a bunch of people are asking you to do stuff and some of it maybe just doesn't is not important to you or doesn't align with your goals you know, that takes up a lot of time and energy. So particularly now with like creative projects I'm working on, you know, I'll get a lot of people who come up to me like at meetups or like, or message me online to try to do projects and stuff. And like, some of them are good ideas, but like there's only 24 hours in a day and like I've got my own projects and stuff. And it's like trying to like work that balance. Um, mm. See, so yeah, I think that's super important for people to try to, get to a point where they can forge their own path and not be worried if somebody's going to be upset. Cause like, I'm sure you've learned this making YouTube videos. Like not everybody's going to like, like the videos you put out and like, oh, no man. matter what you do or say, like someone's going to get upset. <laughs> yeah. Someone's going to get angry and someone's going to correct you. Like that's something that really, I found so funny on YouTube. Like it doesn't really matter what you say. Somebody's going to find a way to correct whatever you said. So at one point you gotta have like a thicker skin and be like, that's that's fine, man. Sometimes I found myself like answer some 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 comments on like, oh, I would love to answer this, but then I will start like a flagging discussion. I'm like, why? Why why should I do that? That's like Facebook battles. Like, why should I engage in that? Like I, no. <laughs> I, I better not. So yeah, that that's part of what I meant by I, I care less about what other people think. Mm -hmm. And when I say other people think, I, I mean about me and I mean about other stuff too. So I usually mm -hmm. like, because it always happens when you see like a news site, what, what happened? And you see like, oh, this bombing or whatever. And then you see the comments and there's always like people saying really horrible things. It doesn't matter what the news is. It doesn't matter what the subject is. It's always people saying horrible stuff. And there's this eager of saying like, why are you saying stupid things? Like it's, it, why? But then at the same time, as, as I grow older, I'm like, yeah, whatever, man. Just say horrible things. It's fine. I'm just going to keep doing my thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because, like, your, your energy would be better focused on, like, creating something or trying to make a positive impact rather than engaging in a discussion with somebody who's negative and probably won't come around anyway. Yeah. So yeah, besides it, it happens when you're with somebody like face to face and you can discuss something, you can tell if the person is willing to change their point of view or not. Like it's super clear when you're, when you're talking about something and the other person is like not wanting to go in your area and try to understand mm -hmm. your point of view. And then you just, you, you call it quits and you're like, Oh, okay. It doesn't matter, man. It's just bad. But <laughs> online you can't tell that. And, and usually nobody wants to give 
like a piece of their argument. Like everybody wants to hold their ground. So it's like, it doesn't really matter why in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's just, people are, people are very interesting. Like you learn about the good and the bad, like, and like, the internet's a double-edged sword, just like humanity can be a double-edged sword where like, you know, it can be a place where people can come together and congregate and be positive and talk and like connect. But it can also be a p place where people just spew hatred or, <laughs> or mean to each other or whatever. So it's, <laughs> it can go either yeah. way. But, you know, the, yeah, that's the one thing I've learned too, is just like, you can't control what other people are doing so like i would spend so much time like oh i can't believe that guy did that or i can't believe that person said that or i can't believe that person like said they were going to meet up with me and then they bailed at the last you know like mm -hmm. but you don't have control over that like you don't have like and if you're so stressed about what other people are doing and or not doing or like not living up to some standard it's you can your emotion gets attached to that and you just get like stuck in a cycle where your emotion is attached to something that you can't really control. Yeah, that's true. So problematic stuff, but so now I'm going to drop the, the big question here. <laughs> so this is the deep one. Uh, so what do you feel that your, your purpose in life is? If you, if you feel that you have one, uh, what would you say your purpose in life is? Uh, I, I guess I guess it will be just what I what I said before, like creating something interesting or something beautiful. I guess that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess the fact that that I want to create as a as a writer or as a photographer or as a, anything, it has to do with that, with the willing to create something that other people might enjoy or or will outlast, like will live longer than me because we're gonna die. So it's like, mm -hmm. okay, if I'm gonna die, I better just leave something and so they can say, oh, this was interesting. Who made this? Well, some guy, but it's cool, right? Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> that's, that's enough, I guess. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I mean, and that's like, when you can have that kind of focus and like, okay, here's what I'm doing every day. Like, this is the kind of lasting impact that I wanna make. Like, that's just, that's the best thing you can have yeah so all right so we are at around an hour here so i want to kind of just get to the point where we're wrapping up so what so what would you say is uh what's coming up next for your for your youtube channel and your photography what are, what are some of the things you're gonna be working on in the next say year oh that's a that's a long run i have no idea i can't plan that <laughs> too much to <laughs> like next week is too much time bro no uh, <laughs> Well, now I'm, I'm going to Chile now. Uh, I'm going to be there on July. Since the end of June until the beginning of August, I'm going to be there touring with my band. And I have to keep the YouTube channel going, so I need to stack videos right now and shoot a, some, some videos so I can release them while I'm there. Because I don't mm -hmm. think I'm going to have the time to shoot any videos there, or at least... Maybe I can shoot them, but I don't think I'll be able to shoot them, develop the roles, scan them, edit the video and upload it and mm -hmm. subtitle the video mm -hmm. while touring with the band. That's not going to happen. Yeah, that's too much. <laughs> yeah, like I, I got to be honest, because every time I go on a, on a trip, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to upload some videos. And then like a week on the tour, like, damn, why do I, why do I say I would do that if it's impossible? So... <laughs> Till August, that's what's happening. I'm gonna stockpile some videos and then release them there. Try to film some videos in Chile with some cameras. I got, I, I bought a camera that my friend who lives in New York got it, and he's gonna bring it to Chile. So we meet there in Chile, and he's gonna give me the camera. I'm gonna use it there. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to find interesting cameras and equipment to try and show on the, on the channel. Um, what's what's coming is I guess I'm, I'm trying to finish the the book that I'm, I'm i'm working on about the mm -hmm. riots and the protests in chile so that's draining mm -hmm. a lot of my time in regards to photography and i'm working also with fran on a graphic novel uh that's I'm taking the other chunk of my time um we we started this this graphic novel it's like a sci-fi graphic novel that we were super happy to have uh but we never finished the project when we started it and now we're we're starting again and we're trying to make it happen and 
and I'm writing the script again and I'm not, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy about that. So that's not YouTube channel related, but it's, it's my life at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, no, that, that's great, man. You, you just like, I guess with the question, one of the questions I'll ask to sort of close is like, how do you, how do you manage and juggle all these multiple projects simultaneously? Like what's your kind of, what's your kind of like method or how do you like keep it all going driving forward? Um, I have a schedule <laughs> on my desk <laughs> divided by which day I do which project. So for, we have a podcast too with Fran in Spanish in which we talk about a book that we just wrote. Uh, I mean, I wrote it and Fran illustrated it. It's a book about friendship. So we have a podcast about friendship. So we have the mm -hmm. day in which we record the podcast and then the day in which we shoot the videos and then we edit those videos and then the scripts and then the designing the book and then just writing the place and then I have to read because I need more material to read and have more ideas and then so yeah. I have all these days laid out and it's funny because we have the same YouTube day so there's one day of the week that you will hear like each one on the roof like blah 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 talking to the cameras <laughs> <laughs> and then both of us like with coffee and eating like crazy and then just giving notes oh this one is too long you should cut this and have me color correct that and just we go to each other's computers and then we keep doing our stuff so it's it's quite hectic we work every day like i have we basically don't have any days off uh, yeah sometimes we do have a saturday or a sunday off but mm -hmm. but I, we, it's it's hard for me to disconnect from work because i do so much stuff and there's always like deadlines coming over mm -hmm. so yeah I, i guess that's the downside of it i'm super happy about everything i'm doing and it's everything excites me enough to wiggle my arms and whatnot Time. it's super tiring so <laughs> yeah yeah I know the feel like I don't even like I don't have like so many different projects but like I have a full-time day job and then outside of it I do the YouTube and the photography stuff and like a podcast and that stuff takes all the other time so like it's seven like I enjoy the photography and the YouTube stuff so like it doesn't really feel like work I mean it's work it takes time but it, but like I'm doing that seven days a week. There's no like, oh, I have a Saturday. I'm just gonna like go to the beach or like chill or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know the feel. Yeah. <laughs> so let's enjoy cool. the sun. No, you have to edit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <that's> true. <laughs> so, uh, where can people where can people connect with you and like see some of your content? And uh, what's the best way for people to to support you in the work that you're doing? Uh, what are some ways that people can do that? Oh, you can go and visit my YouTube channel. And I, I don't really know the address of my YouTube channel. I've been trying to change it. I guess it's youtube.com slash Profeta Paranoia. Or I tried to change it to Ed Paves, but I don't know what happened. It's weird. <laughs> but Well, anyway, it's there. You can search Ed Paves on, on YouTube and I'm going to be there. Uh, you can search me on Instagram on at Ed Paves. Um, yeah, you can support me on Patreon if you really like what I do. I I try to, to upload more. I'm super bad at Patreon. I, oh man, no, I'm super good. No, please donate on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I try to do my best, but I'm doing so much stuff that try, I try to keep up with Patreon, and sometimes I neglect it, and then I ask, I, I say I'm sorry, and then I post more stuff. It's, <laughs> I, I still trying to figure out how to make it work in a more organic way because right now I have this. Yeah. Like I have Patreon in here, I'm trying to connect with it, but I haven't like completely absorbed it. So I guess that's mm -hmm. uh, that's the next step. Try to really connect with the audience there and try to make something more interesting than what I already have in there. Um, yeah, so that's that's what coming for Patreon. All right, cool. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on tonight. This has been a fun conversation. Like I knew. I knew it was going to be a, a good time with a lot of laughs on here. So thank you so much for <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad we can finally link this up. <laughs> I know you're really busy. So yeah. And uh, for all the people who tuned in tonight, thank you for watching. You will be able to watch the replay of the live stream on my channel and I'll have the audio uh, of this episode on SoundCloud and iTunes for the Dan Pullman Photography Podcast. So we'll see you soon, folks. This has been another episode of the Dan Bull Photography Podcast. Peace. <laughs>